Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to our GIA knowledge sessions. Uh, these are a series of talks and seminars that are fueled by GIA's decades of research. And it's our mission to share our discoveries and learnings with the world. So I'm really excited to kick things off today. I'm Kelly Giordano, a member of the content team here at GIA. And I'm joined by Dr. Sally Magana, the Senior Manager of Diamond Identification. And she's gonna tell us all about the science behind colored diamonds. So before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. Everyone attending this is automatically on mute, but we'd love to hear your questions. So please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we go, and there will be a Q&A session at the end where Sally will have the opportunity to answer some of your questions. Uh, we'll also be sending a recording of the session uh, in a follow-up email, and that email will also include a survey, so we would love to hear your feedback. And with that, I'm gonna pass you over to Sally. Thank you, Kelly, and good day, everyone. I'm very happy you're here because that tells me that you're interested in learning about natural fancy colored diamonds. Today, we will be going through the rainbow, and I hope you learn something helpful about color in diamonds and how defects play a role in creating these beautiful stones. Uh, I will be providing an overview of all the color-causing defects and discussing absorption spectra and how to read them. I'll then go through what we call the major color groups and the causes of color within each of those groups. Since we are covering the entire rainbow, we will be giving the highlights and major points for each of the colors. Uh, we are planning a series of feature talks where we spend the entire hour covering just one of the color groups. So if you want more detail on the greens or the blues, then check back in for those later talks. What is diamond? It's a simple material, just carbon, and it can be, the atoms can be covalently bonded in this tetrahedral arrangement. It occurs naturally or can be grown in a laboratory. This example here shows a perfect diamond in a perfect arrangement, and it is colorless. However, uh, some fun things can happen when we start adding defects. In this example, we're going to change one of those carbon atoms into nitrogen. And we've found that depending on the defect, depending on the concentration, that these results can be quite beautiful. So I'm gonna segue for a minute to a metaphor and then circle back to diamond. At the top, we have some Egyptian hieroglyphics that went unknown and untranslatable for centuries. And then around 1800, some French soldiers discovered the Rosetta Stone and that acted as a translator for all of the Egyptian hieroglyphics, so that we were then able to understand all of their stories and their history. Similarly with diamond, when we look at the stone, we don't know the defects, we don't know the cause of color, we don't know its history. So we need something to act as a translator. And for us, that's a spectrometer. And in this case, we're using an infrared spectrometer to see what are the secrets with inside this diamond and see what are the stories that can be told through the spectroscopy. So from looking at this IR spectrum, we can tell that it is a type 1B diamond with single isolated nitrogen. And from looking at that, we know a lot more about its story and uh, what could have happened to it in the past. So that's what we do a lot with spectroscopy. We use that to be the story, a translator and to act as the storyteller for the diamonds. So we're gonna start off by looking at pure carbon. It's perfectly arranged in its uh, normal tetrahedral arrangement. And we're gonna start off by looking at some of the intrinsic defects. What that means are defects that just involve carbon. We haven't involved any other elements yet. All we're gonna do is do things to the diamond lattice. So we're gonna start off by talking about those. Uh, first of all, uh, we can create vacancies. If this uh, diamond is exposed to radiation, either through uh, natural mineral, uh, natural mineral uh, radioactive natural mineral grains or uh, radioactive fluids or in a laboratory, those can create vacancies by knocking some of those carbons out of their home position. And what that can do is create a vibrant green color in the stone. If instead of uh, adding vacancies through radiation. Let's just go back to that pure carbon lattice. 
And what we're going to do instead is we're going to have a major geologic forces create a kink in the diamond and, dis and create distortions and displace the atoms. And now instead of creating one vacancy, we're creating these families of vacancies. And what that does is it creates, <coughs> um, in this example, can create some brown graining along those places where those atoms were displaced. So a lot of stones, diamonds have brown color and some very special diamonds in encountering forces that we don't fully understand yet uh, can have uh, additional uh, defects created that, um, that imparts a pink to red color in the diamond. So now let's go back to our perfect diamond lattice. And we're looking at just carbon again. And now we're gonna start looking at impurity related defects where we're gonna swap out some of these carbon atoms for other elements. So let's start with nitrogen. Let's swap out a few of those carbon atoms for nitrogen. And there's a lot of nitrogen. It's one of the most abundant elements in the universe and certainly also on this planet. Also, the atom size for nitrogen is very similar to carbon. So it loves going into diamond and it will go in at very high concentrations. And so that helps uh, the, the, the abundance of nitrogen in diamond helps create a lot of the variety and the importance of all the nitrogen related defects that we see and that we're gonna talk about today. But the simplest one is just these single isolated nitrogens. And that can impart a very vibrant canary colored yellow, uh, yellow color to the diamond. But let's say instead of nitrogen, we instead swap in boron. This diamond has grown very deep in the earth, 600 kilometers deep. And instead of having a yellow color, we have a very deep blue. Now uh, we can start combining these different defects together. We talked earlier that if we have a vacancy that can create a green diamond, or if we have a nitrogen that can create a yellow, you put them together, you get something else entirely. You can get a pink color. These are very rare in nature. Um, we don't see this cause of color very often in nature, but we do see these a lot in treated pinks. Uh, a lot of the treated pink diamonds that we see either that were earth grown or lab grown and have been subsequently treated, uh, by and large, those get their color from nitrogen vacancy centers. But it's not as simple as that. You might think you add more defects, you add more color, but there are some other defects that uh, can be created that are uh, colorless. And those include what we call the A center and the B center. The A center is a nitrogen pair. So if two of those single nitrogens pair up, it's no longer that canary yellow diamond. Instead, the diamond becomes colorless. And that happens uh, uh, those nitrogen pairings happen as the earth, as the diamond has been residing in the earth for millions and millions of years. And then those pairs will eventually become four nitrogens surrounding a vacancy, which is also colorless. And that's because these occur in the infrared. These, uh, these are defects that don't occur within the visible, like the others that we mentioned earlier do. These have, uh, are occur only in the infrared. But there are some other defects that have formed along the way between the A, uh, as we go from A centers to B centers that form as well. And those include the N3 center, which is three nitrogens in a vacancy, and the H3 center, which is two nitrogens in a vacancy. And if these are present in high enough concentration within the diamond, then we can see a yellow color as a result. So we have a huge list here of various defects, but we're gonna see these characters a lot as we go through the upcoming slides and we look at the major causes of color across all of the different color groups. So keep these and the intrinsic ones that we talked about on the previous slide in mind, because we're gonna see these quite a bit. Since we are talking about color, let's also talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. And Visible light occurs in this narrow, very narrow band. And sometimes it's amazing to think that uh, every, all the ways that we interact with the world and see the world just occurs in this very narrow band. And in gemology, what we look most at is just uh, a little bit of the ultraviolet, the visible from 400 to 700 nanometers, and then a, a little bit into the infrared. So we're going to be talking a lot about this visible light in the coming slides. 
So this is an illustration of what's happening in the diamond. It's white light going in, and sometimes we forget that all the color components that go into white light. The white light enters the diamond, bounces around inside and off all those facets, and interacts with the diamond. And the diamond, one, and this particular diamond, wants to keep the blue and the violet. It's going to keep it, and it's only going to transmit out yellow color. And we've known this for a long time. Decades ago, Bob Crowningshield, uh, with his spectroscope, documented a series of black lines that occur within Cape Diamonds. Later on, technology evolved so we could record spectra, a two-dimensional representation of Mr. Crowning Shield's results. And as scientists, we love numbers. We want to know the precise locations for each of these peaks or these bands within the spectrograph and know that this uh, feature, this dark line right here and this peak is at occurs at 415.2 nanometers, and it is the N3 defect. So we know exactly what that peak is, and we know how it's formed. You've probably seen a lot of absorption spectra, and to understand color in gemstones, it's important to understand what it's showing us. On the x-axis here, we're showing the wavelength, and we're showing all the colors of the rainbow from 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. And along the y-axis, as we go up, we're showing absorbance. And on, as we go down, we're showing transmittance. So if you want to read the defects causing absorption, then you need to read the peaks. You need to read the absorption peaks. But if you want to see uh, what the color is, then you read the valleys. So in this particular stone, we're having absorption within the blue all the way up to uh, near the red, and then we're having a transmission, win uh, what we call a transmission window within the red. And that's what creates this vibrant pink stone. So if we look at many diamonds, we can see the variety of possible spectra. And these are all defects that we saw back on those earlier slides. Some of them can be sharp peaks, such as the N3 and N2, or the GR1, and some are broad bands. And we know precisely the corresponding defect associated with each of these. Um, and you notice that each one is different. Each spectrum is different and diagnostic for that cause of color. One other thing I want to mention is that all of these spectra are collected at liquid nitrogen temperature at 77 Kelvin or minus 196 degrees Celsius. And we do that by submerging the diamonds within liquid nitrogen. And that's one of the great properties of diamond. It has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. So we are able to safely submerge diamonds into liquid nitrogen. And why do we want to do that? It's so that we can sharpen these peaks. If we were to look at these at room temperature, they would be much broader and flatter than what we were able to see here. And we we're able to see precisely the wavelength positions and the, for each of these features. So let's go through the diamonds. The top one is a redstone, and it has a 550 nanometer band that is created by plastic deformation and creates, uh, helps, helps to uh, create the red, uh, red color. But we also see some nitrogen contribution over here in the blue. And, we, and that's just something we see a lot in natural stones is we, and helps contribute a lot to the color in a lot of different um, natural stones is that nitrogen absorbing in the blue. So this absorption from the nitrogen is helped uh, to contribute to the overall absorption that we see for this red diamond and helps to give it that vibrant red instead of something that would more likely be pink if we did not have that nitrogen absorption. The next one I'm talking about is this green stone. Uh, again, we have nitrogen related absorption within the blue and that is flanked by this radiation-induced uh, peak called the GR1 that absorbs it in the red. So we have absorption in the blue, we have absorption in the red. That creates this transmission in the middle here, right at the green. Um, this is an example of a yellow diamond that shows uh, Cape peaks that absorb within the blue, allowing it to transmit within the yellow. And then this bottom stone is a brown diamond. You can see it's got this general broad absorption 
across the whole wavelength range. There's no distinct pinks here, peaks here, but we know what this, these are and we know how to identify them. For a lot of these defects that we're talking about, they not only absorb and create yellow color, but they can also emit and create fluorescence. For example, this N3 defect, um, scientists before me have uh, been able to identify the composition of this and have identified it as three nitrogens uh, surrounding a vacancy with its principal absorption at 415 nanometers. And that creates yellow color in diamond, but it also creates uh, blue, corresponding blue fluorescence. And this is the well-known fluorescence that we see in about one third of the D to Z diamonds. It's from this same defect. So it's something to keep in mind that uh, a lot of these defects not only create absorption, but can also create fluorescence as well. So with that introduction, we're going to go now into the color groups. I'm going to start off with the yellow diamonds. Uh, the ones by far are the most abundant among fancy color gem diamonds. Most of these uh, causes of color involve nitrogen, so I'm going to review the various diamond types. Up at the top here, we have diamonds that don't contain uh, measurable quantities of nitrogen within the IR spectrum. So you have no ni measurable nitrogen, no measurable boron, they are called type 2A. If they do have measurable boron, then they are classified as type 2B. Now, among those with nitrogen, they start off as type 1B, isolated nitrogen. This is how they look when they are first formed, uh, when they are very young diamonds and deep in the earth. And over the millions and billions of years, and the temperatures of around 1,000 degrees Celsius they're exposed to, those nitrogens will slowly get together and pair up into either a pair of nitrogens that we call the A center or the four nitrogens and a vacancy that we call a B center. And that creates the colorless diamonds that we see on the D to Z scale. But along with that conversion from A center to B center, we do have some other side, react, uh, side formations that occur as well, where we can create this N3 center and this H3 center. And all of these involve nitrogen and we're gonna be talking about those on the next slide. So yellow diamonds, there are four major causes of color in them, <clears throat> for them. And you can look at these uh, pictures that they all of the colors look very similar. And just from looking at the stones, it's difficult to tell what the cause of color is. But all of it can be revealed from the visible absorption spectrum. So we're gonna go through these one by one. Uh, the upper left here, we have a cape yellow. These are by far the most abundant among yellows. Probably about 70% of yellow diamonds are colored by these cape features, where we have the N3, N3 and, its, and uh, its related N2 peak. Uh, next up in order of abundance is isolated nitrogen impurities. We talked about that a lot on the earlier slides. Those are type 1B canary colors. And the, and the visible absorption spectrum for these is you see general absorption across the visible wavelength range uh, as the peak, actual peak itself is not within the visible, it's within the ultraviolet. So we see the tail of that within the visible. The next most common cause of color is the 480 nanometer band. And we don't have a better term for it besides that. And this is actually one of the enduring mysteries that we have currently uh, with diamond color and diamond science is what a specific defect involved with creating this 480 nanometer band. Uh, we know that we see it in diamonds that have A centers and uh, low amounts of C centers. Some scientists have correlated it perhaps with oxygen, uh, but we don't fully know what causes this color. And then finally, uh, we have diamonds that are colored by H3 that has a high amount of H3 and, <clears throat> and it doesn't have a corresponding amount of H3 fluorescence and we just have H3 absorption, then that will also create a yellow color in the stone. The color range for these uh, varies depending on the cause of color. If you're looking at diamonds that have cape defects, then you're often looking at yellow stones. But you can also see an increasing amount of brown color that is associated with hydrogen impurities. And the more hydrogen you have, then the more brownish this, cup, this uh, cape diamond can become. 
So it can exist all along this continuum, depending on how much hydrogen can influence the color. Uh, among isolated nitrogen stones, uh, here we have a sort of a baseline of a, a pure yellow. And then you can have some increase in orange. If you increase the amount of isolated nitrogen in the stone, then it increases up that uh, tail that extends into the visible and it, and it shifts the transmission window from the yellow into the orange. If this is a diamond that experienced plastic deformation, and that's going to uh, impart a, a brownish color from that plastic deformation to the yellow color. And so you'll get more of a brownish yellow as a result. Among the 480 nanometer band diamonds, depending on how uh, pronounced that band is, you can shift from a yellow color to an orange. In fact, the vast majority of pure orange diamonds are colored by the 480 nanometer band. And then finally, H3 defects. If, uh, you, if all you're seeing is H3 absorption and, and little no fluorescence, all that fluorescence is quenched by other defects that are, are in the diamond, then you're going to see a yellow color. But if, if you're able to start seeing that greenish fluorescence, then you're going to see the combination of blue, uh, of the diamond absorbing blue and transmitting yellow, but it's also emitting H greenish fluorescence. <clears throat> Um, you can also have a, co a combination of both H3 and the 550 nanometer band, which will increase the amount of orange coloration in the stone. I'm going to move on now to pink, red, brown, purple diamonds. There's a lot of colors there under that pink umbrella. And the reason is because most of these have a similar cause of color and most of them also contain this 550 nanometer absorption band. So uh, this slide here shows the color range for uh, many of the diamonds. We're looking at just pink color. It can vary in saturation from a very light pink up into a fancy red. If we have plastic deformation influencing uh, and, a, and brownish uh, plastic deformation influencing the color, then you can get uh, a brownish contribution as well. If the 550 nanometer band is shifted and broadened slightly, then that uh, helps uh, impart an orange coloration to the stone. And then you can also get purple as well. If you're not having nitrogen related absorptions, if the band is quite wide, then you will also see a purple color for that. And I'll show a little bit more about purples on the on, uh, upcoming slide. The two major causes of color for pinks are uh, nitrogen vacancy centers. This isn't really a major cause for natural diamonds. Only about one half of one percent of natural pink diamonds are colored by nitrogen vacancy centers. But however, among treated pinks <coughs> and lab-grown pinks, it is the most common, the dominant cause of color for those. Among naturals, by and large, 99.5% are colored by this 550 nanometer absorption band due to plastic deformation defects. Here we're showing a variety of absorption spectra for some pink diamonds. Down here at the bottom, you will be seeing the absorption spectrum for one of the Golconda pinks. You can see it's very distinct from what we see for uh, natural diamonds with the 550 band. Very distinct and uh, and you know immediately the cause of color, whether it's uh, the 550 or the nitrogen vacancy centers. And then here we have a number of natural pink diamonds, and these all contain the 550 band. Some are more obvious than others. This fancy dark brown, you can see a very slight one, but it's not enough to influence the color. On this top spectrum, you can see the contribution of those nitrogen-related uh, centers as well, the N3 and the H3. We've talked about those a lot, and those are characters that we see in so many of natural diamonds, including pinks, um, as they help to raise up that overall absorption and help increase the, uh, uh, the transmission window within the pink as well. This slide shows a comparison of two diamonds, both of which have the 550 nanometer band but the observed color is very different between the two. 
This top one is a purple stone, and you can see it has no nitrogen related uh, absorption here. It does have nitrogen in it, it has some A centers, but it did not uh, create any H3 or N3 to a significant concentration to affect the color. So instead, you just have this one broad 550 nanometer band. For this pinkish orange, we also see the 550. It's a little bit narrower and it's often also shifted slightly from the, uh, the one we see for the purple, but we also see a pronounced H3 and N3 absorption that helps shift the window over into the orange and the red and does not allow for any blue contribution to help with the purple color for this one. One of the really interesting things about pink diamonds and what makes them so exciting for me to work with is um, some of these microscopic observations that are seen. Um, for those on the left side, you can see that they have uh, uh, some very distinctive properties within the microscope. You can see that the color is concentrated along these sort of wavy bands, but you can also see that there is some subtle pink color outside of those as well. And if we take IR spectra on them, then we see that they are type 1A and that the A aggregates are less than the B aggregates. So it's further along that aggregation pathway than something that is, um, has just A aggregates alone. And the dominant source and other interesting thing about these is that the uh, microscopic observations and the diamond type observations seem to be very site specific. So a lot, most of these diamonds come from Argyle. They don't, they, all of them do not, but it's just considering the volume of diamonds that are type 1A, A less than B, that come from Argyle, just looking at a stone with these, it's a, it's a decent hypothesis, but not proof that something uh, well, that this sort of diamond did come from Argyle. Similarly, if you look at stones that are type 1AA greater than B, then we see very different uh, features within the microscope. We see that the uh, color banding is very straight. It's not wavy like it was for the Argyles. And we also see that there is no color contained between the bands. It's uh, the only color we see is within the bands themselves. There isn't uh, a slight color within, like there is for the argyles. And so um, there are several sources for these types of diamonds in which the A aggregates outnumber the B aggregates, but uh, the Siberia is the dominant source for these at the moment. And then there's the type 2A diamonds that have even coloration when you look at them in the microscope. And these don't really have a, a very well uh, known source uh, locality that we've been able to determine, but the type 2A pinks that have a known source that we've seen have come from Africa. Okay. <coughs> Pardon me. I gave you a moment to digest this uh, chart. What we're see showing along the bottom is color saturation from faint to very deep to dark. And these were for uh, 1,000 uh, pink stones. And, and then what we're chronicling along the y-axis is the percentage of diamonds with specific optical absorption spectral features. So for all of those that are just showing as pink, all of those have the 550 nanometer band alone. When we look at those that are fancy, intense, vivid, or deep, we start to see those that ha are signified by the green, the blue, and the purple. And that means that those have, in addition to the 550 nanometer band, they also have H3, N3, or both. So uh, what it looks like from these is that you really need the contribution of those nitrogen-related defects to help boost up the overall absorption in order to get the pink into these fancy, intense, and vivid color ranges. And one of the reasons we mentioned that is because as A goes to B, as A aggregates go to B aggregates, you do tend to have a higher creation of N3 and H3 as a result. So we expect to see more of these very intensely colored due to N3 and H3 among the Argyles, among 
stones that are type 1AA less than B. Uh, and, and, and that is proven to be the case, that these generally have more H3 and N3. And having those defects correlate with most, in, uh, uh, most intensely colored pink and red diamonds. I'm going to move on now to green diamonds. There's four major causes of color for these. And we normally think of green diamonds, we normally think of just the GR1, uh, those uh, created by radiation. And that is definitely one of the, the, the major causes of color, and it's the one that gives these vibrant, intense, pure green colors. But it's not the only one. There are a total of four, and you can see from these absorption spectra that they are all very distinct. And so we can tell from the absorption spectra what the cause of color is, and then we can know a lot more about its treatment and uh, history. And <clears throat> so we have the GR1, uh, which is caused by uh, radiation. It creates absorption in the red, and usually, often in natural diamonds, it's flanked by nitrogen-related absorption in the blue, creates the window in the green. Uh, the next most common is the H3. We talked about this uh, with the yellows. It's, uh, and what we see here with the greens is that we have a, uh, not just absorption of the blue, but we also have fluorescence and a green fluorescence contribution that uh, contributes to the body color. So we have H3 absorption here within the blue, creating a yellow body color. And then we also have H3 green fluorescence, which creates, uh, which tips this from a yellow over to a yellowish green. We can also have hydrogen related defects and in which um, that creates absorption up within the red to near infrared. And when it's flanked by nitrogen absorption in the blue, that creates a transmission window within the green. Similarly, nickel related defects. These are too common in nature. They're a lot easier to be produced by HPHT growth. But if you have a high amount of nickel, that also creates a absorption feature within the red to near infrared, and then flanked by nitrogen in <clears throat> down in the uh, the blue, you get a transmission window within the green. So the color ranges that we see can vary a lot depending on that cause of color. For GR ones, we can. Uh, see this very vibrant green, and as we get fewer and fewer defects, we can have a decrease in saturation. Or if we do not have that nitrogen-related absorption within the blue, uh, blue region, and we have no nitrogen, if it's a type, if it's an irradiated type 2A, then instead of the transmission window being in the green, it'll shift to the blue, and we start to see more of a greenish-blue color or a bluish-green color. For the H3, we can have a continuum as well based on the concentration of defects, but also how much the H3 is absorbing uh, and fluorescing. So we can have that range from greenish yellow to yellowish green, and we can have variation in the saturations as well. And for the hydrogen and nickel related defects, based on the concentration uh, of, of the defects, we can see an increasing amount of saturation. I'm going to spend a couple more slides talking about radiation-related green diamonds. <clears throat> a lot of stones have, uh, while they are in their rough state, have this blue to green surface coloration. We call them green, skin, green skins. And oftentimes, that is removed by polishing. And that often results from alpha and beta radiation, in which it does not penetrate deeply into the stone. It's more difficult and more rare to get uh, beta or gamma radiation that will penetrate much more deeply into the stone and create a whole body coloration and turn the whole diamond into a green color. This requires irradiation over long periods of geologic time, but also, uh, also very special sets of conditions that allows this radiation chain to move forward. So, and so this is an example of what of um, diamonds that have a green surface radiation, and then when they are blocked and faceted, you no longer see 
that green color. It's not able to be maintained within the polygem. <clears throat> However, for this one that does have a green body color, you are able to see that within the uh, within the faceted stone. Another issue related to green diamonds <clears throat> is uh, <clears throat> you know, talk about the radiation. Is that uh, what that does is it kicks out a carbon from the lattice position, and the vacancies in the diamond will absorb the light at greater than 550. Most natural diamonds, because they have uh, nitrogen within the stone, will appear color will appear as green, and sometimes they will occasionally appear as blue. Preservation of the green color also requires the diamond irradiation to occur at very shallow depths in the earth. The reason we know that uh, the radiation can only occur after the diamond has gone, uh, been brought up by the kimberlite from deep in the earth to the near surface region is because the green color, it does not persist for temperatures greater than five to 600 degrees Celsius. And a diamond will routinely see those temperatures very deep in the earth. You have to be in the near surface region in order to see those very low temperatures that allow the preservation of green color. So that's how we know that green color can only be created within the near surface region. And so even after uh, the diamond has been ejected from the kimberlite up at the near surface region, these diamond stories are not over. Nature is still imparting uh, more defects and more uh, story to, uh, to the diamonds. I'm going to switch now to blue, gray, violet diamonds. And these also have four major causes of color. Normally, when we think of blue, uh, blue diamonds, we normally just think of boron. And that's, uh, we'll talk about that one first. Um, the uh, absorption spectrum is relatively featureless across the visible range. What we're seeing here is the tail of an, of an absorption feature that happens within the infrared. And it's at about 2,800 wave numbers. And so that increases the absorption within, in the infrared and the near infrared, and then it slopes down, it comes into the red, leaving a transmission window within the blue. Hydrogen-related defects, we talked about those earlier in relation to green diamonds, but depending on how the bands have shifted, you can also see a blue, gray, or violet color. And one interesting thing about these stones is that they have two transmission windows, one in the blue and one in the red. And we'll talk about those a little more in a few slides. Then we also have GR1-related defects, where if you have low nitrogen in the stone, and that transmission window will, and, it, uh, and the radiation will cause it to absorb within the red, and the and uh, will have a, a transmission window within the blue to green. And then inclusions; those are uh, uh, interesting, uh, and they're not too plentiful. But we do get some fancy gray stones that are colored by inclusions, uh, not by atomic uh, color centers. And these are really a close cousin of the fancy whites that we'll be talking about in a few slides. Now this pie chart over on the right, it, sh it shows the cause of color distribution among these stones. And you can see about one third of them are type 2B. And uh, so only one third of the stones within this color group are actually colored by boron. Uh, we also have about one third due to hydrogen and one third due to uh, the GR1. But we'll be talking about the differences between them within this color group on the next slide. On the left, we're showing the hue of the stones and, uh, and comparing that to the cause of color. So diamonds that are uh, green blue or greenish blue, all of those are colored by GR1. <clears throat> those that are uh, uh, pure blue or unmodified blue, uh, about a um, little more than half of those are colored by boron, and half of the and, and the remainder are colored, and most of the remainder are colored by GR1. Among blue gray to gray blue stones, you're getting roughly equal populations of boron and hydrogen. And then as you um, then as you shift to the grays to the violet grays, 
then by and large, those are populated by um, diamonds that are colored by hydrogen. Over here on the right, we're showing the tone saturation of these as you go from faint uh, up to uh, fancy intense and fancy deep and dark. And what you see is that among the most vivid colors, we see a high population of those colored by boron. So that's one of the reasons why we think so much of boron related to the type two, uh, as related to blue diamonds, is that those are the ones that show the blue color most intensely and show unmod unmodified blue, not, uh, not including green or gray uh, contributions. So the, this slide shows the color range for uh, three of those four major causes of color. Uh, if you have plastic deformation in these stones, uh, then instead of it appearing as brown, it appears as gray colors for uh, these uh, blue diamonds. So instead of, uh, so you can go from fancy light blue over to a gray coloration. And then you can also get increasing depth of color as you increase the amount of boron that's detected. For those that are colored due to hydrogen, you can also get increasing depth of color in those and those colored by GR1. Uh, it will, as you increase the number of defects and you increase the concentration of those, you, get, you generally get increasing depth of color. This slide shows infrared absorption spectra for three type 2b diamonds. They all show that characteristic absorption related to boron at 2800 wave numbers. And, and what we're seeing for this uh, deep blue one, we're seeing this absorption gradient that goes from the infrared towards the visible. And that creates uh, absorption within the red and a transmission window within the blue for this diamond. Now, this isn't a perfect correlation. There certainly are some exceptions, but generally, the more amount of boron you have, the deeper blue the blue color is. So for this example, this is a colorless type 2B sample. You, you aren't, it's probably a D or E color, you're not able to see it. And it only has 30 parts per billion. For this stone, it's a fancy light, and, you're, and we detected about 140 parts per billion. And then this stone, uh, it's um, much, much greater, around 700 parts per billion of boron uh, to create that. So also when you look at these, you know, just think about, um, that we are looking at concentrations that are in the part per billion range. It doesn't take a lot of boron to really have a pronounced effect on these stones. One of the uh, most famous uh, observations for type 2B diamonds are their observed phosphorescence. And this was actually one of the first uh, research projects I did related to gem diamonds was I was working in Washington, D.C., and we were going to uh, study the phosphorescence on the Hope Diamond. It had been observed many times before, and, but they'd never really been documented or had the phosphorescence specter of it recorded. So that was one of my first uh, projects related to uh, gem diamonds, was looking at the phosphorescence spectra for the Hope Diamond and for many of the, of the other blue diamonds in their uh, collection. And one thing we noticed was that all type 2B diamonds have phosphorescence at, um, at either 660 nanometers, that gives the red color, or, it's, or the more common 500 nanometers, that gives a blue color. All the type 2B diamonds that uh, we looked at would have, showed phosphorescence, had it at either 660 nanometers or 500 nanometers. And oftentimes they showed both. The Hope Diamond is an example, as you watch it phosphoresce, It'll start off with an orangey color and then transition to a more red. Uh, this slide shows an example of a stone that started off with the blue phosphorescence as being dominant and the most intense, and that, but it decayed quickly away. And then the longer lasting uh, red phosphorescence, 60 nanometers, observed, endured a lot longer. So that's what we're showing in this film strip here. At five second intervals, we're seeing the blue phosphorescence, and then we're seeing that slowly decay away, and then we're seeing the persistence of the red phosphorescence until that slowly decays away as well. 
up in the up in this upper right hand corner we're showing a compilation of phosphorescence ob observations that we had for various blue to violet diamonds and remember the hope diamond is a blue, gray blue stone and it showed both the 500 and the 660 so it would be included within this population here but what we saw was that for pure blue stones by and large they have that blue phosphorescence dominant and then as you go towards the gray colors and the violet grays those that are affected by plastic deformation you see a shift to those that uh, demonstrate the red phosphorescence as well i'm going to switch now to those another class of blue diamonds those colored by hydrogen the interesting thing about these is that by and large most of these are sourced from the argyle mine and they are also very distinctive in their IR spectra as well. These IR look very different from the type 2B diamonds that we showed earlier. They have very high amounts of nitrogen. In fact, it saturates our detector, but we're not able to see the specific concentrations of A and B aggregates because it's beyond the limits of our detector. But we also see high amounts of hydrogen in these stones as well. Another interesting thing about these is because they have two transmission windows, then you can have a slight alexandrite effect. If you light the stone in incandescent light, then the transmission window that's within the red is uh, dominantly seen. And if you light the stone with daylight, then the transmission window within the blue is the one dominantly seen. So that's another interesting uh, effect that we see for these hydrogen related blue gray violet stones. It's not always as dramatic as that. Sometimes it can be more subtle, but it is definitely very interesting to see. I'm gonna discuss very briefly about fancy white, fancy black diamonds. Instead of seeing differences in color saturation, instead we see differences in transparency. They can appear translucent and go towards opaque for both the whites and the blacks. And these are different from the others that we've looked at in which we're not seeing atomic scale defects. Instead, we're seeing color that's generally due to nanometer to micrometer sized inclusions. Another interesting dichotomy between these is that fancy whites are, uh, can only be seen in nature. We don't know a way, uh, we haven't seen one at GIA yet that has been treated or has been grown in a laboratory. Conversely, there's many ways to create treated fancy black stones. So uh, near the end of my talk, I'm just gonna briefly go back to what I mentioned at the beginning, is that spectroscopy uh, allows these stones to um, <clears throat> uh, provide uh, their story. They, uh, and the spectroscopy acts as a translator so that we can interpret the, the defects in a language that we can understand. This top stone is that we know from its spectrum that it is natural color and and we know that this bottom spectrum from is for an irradiated CBD synthetic. And for the rarest of diamonds, the story can be quite viable and they're also very quite beautiful. Uh, this will be my last slide. Um, I wanted to mention that we have this natural color diamond series that we've published in Gems and Gemology, where we've gone through some of the major color groups, uh, the greens, the blues, the pinks, and the fancy whites and fancy blacks. Uh, we are having an upcoming article for yellow to orange diamonds. That'll be the last of our color diamond series that's scheduled to uh, be published in our summer 2020 issue. And then we also have an article uh, on D to Z diamonds that's scheduled for the fall 2020 issue. That was really interesting to explore and I'm really excited for that one to come out. So thank you very much for your attention and we're ready for questions. Yes, we have a lot of great questions. So thank you, Sally, that was fantastic information. Um, we have a few questions uh, to just go into a little bit more detail about some of the topics that you covered. So. Can you give any more information or context around the nanometer ban? Um, you mean the, the wavelengths of light? 
yeah, like what is it and how does it affect how we're evaluating colored diamonds? Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I, sorry, I'm not sure I understand. Can you? It was just somebody asking, you know, what is the nanometer band? Maybe even talking about like the 550 and, you know, oh. what, what is it? And, and oh, okay. more the, the information. 550 nanometer band. Yeah, that's something that we see in pink diamonds. And it's centered at 550 nanometers. And we call it a band because it's very broad. It's not a sharp peak. And that makes the identification of it more difficult. We don't know precisely what it is. Uh, the only thing we know about it is that it correlates with plastic deformation. And so we see that in diamonds that have been plastically deformed. So we, uh, we also have a similar uh, unknown uh, band of 480 nanometers that we see in yellow to orange diamonds. So we also don't know what that is. So th those are some of the mysteries that we have that, that are the subject of ongoing research where we're trying to know better precisely what the defects are so that we can create a good uh, diagram of this configuration like previous scientists have been able to diagnose that the N3 center was three nitrogens and a vacancy. We're not to that point yet for pink diamonds that, that are colored by the 550 nanometer band or the orange to yellow diamonds that are colored by the 480. So those are some of the mysteries we still have. Great. Can you give more information about what plastic deformation is? Well, that happens uh, deep in the earth. Uh, we are not able to uh, witness it uh, directly. And what happens is that the, the geologic forces will cause the diamonds to shear and, uh, and, create, a, and create those kinks that we showed in those early slides. It creates a lot of uh, vacancy clusters. And so we're able to look at the effects of it and we can make um, uh, assumptions based on what we how we know diamonds function at those temperatures and pressures, but we uh, aren't able, it's not very easy to witness it uh, firsthand, even experimentally. Okay. Uh, what would lead to a diamond color being reported as undeterminable? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. And we see that a lot, particularly with green diamonds. Um, when uh, a diamond is irradiated, whether it's irradiated in the laboratory or irradiated in the earth, it creates the same defect center. And so sometimes it is uh, very, uh, it is difficult to understand, to know for sure whether that irradiation occurred in nature or occurred in the laboratory. We, we are able to determine for most, but not all. And so if we're not fully sure, then we, uh, we use the undetermined. Okay. Um, among naturally occurring diamonds, what is the rarest color? I would probably say violet. A pure, you know, a lot of these uh, you know, unmodified colors are very rare. Uh, unmodified orange, there's a lot of say, yellowish orange or orange yellows or brownish orange but have a pure unmodified orange is very rare uh, similarly uh, unmodified purple or unmodified violet those we don't see very often uh, we can see many pinkish purple stones but it's very rare to see a, a unmodified purple so okay does violet get their own category or do that does that fall into like a purple or gray or is it its own thing um violets are often grouped in with the blues and grays just because they have overlapping causes of color mostly most of the the violet gray or gray violet stones that we see have color due to hydrogen or due to boron and so it overlaps with those the purples are colored by the 550 nanometer band, and those uh, couple better with the pinks. So even though violet and purple may appear very similar, they have different causes of color, so we group them separately. Okay. How can you differentiate between natural vacancy and any treatment caused vacancy? Um, 
well, we look at, well, we don't just look at the GR1, we look at uh, other features that are generated by irradiation as well. Um, a lot of natural stones will also have irradiation stains that are put onto the surface of a diamond because it's been in direct physical contact with a radioactive grain or uh, if it's fluids, oftentimes that will seep into cracks that are within the, the rough stone. So being able to look at the rough is also a, a big help. So um, we want to see some of those also to uh, look at a natural versus treated. Okay. Is there a single cause for chameleon diamond color? Uh, that, that's uh, uh, chameleons. Those are also really interesting. Uh, those are sort of a subset of the green diamonds. We didn't have a chance to talk about those, but we will talk about it in our upcoming talk about devoted just to green diamonds. Um, they, uh, and, we, and those are another thing, we don't fully know what the cause of color is. There have been a number of different uh, proposals and hypotheses about what causes the color, but it's not uh, really been decided yet. Okay. Can nitrogen vacancy and nitrogen clusters change their configuration over time or through treatments? Um, yes, uh, normally it acquires temper uh, temperatures greater than about 600 degrees Celsius. That's what uh, that's a pretty good threshold to uh, allow vacancies to go mobile. And vacancies will move first and then that helps the nitrogens shift around some or helps the vacancies migrate to a nitrogen. So you pre, um, you're not going to get a lot of things happening at lower temperatures in terms of nitrogen in, until you hit about the 600 degrees Celsius threshold. But yeah, certainly treatments uh, can move around uh, nitrogen, but they move around in expected ways. And so we know from all of the uh, everything we see in a spectrum, what uh, <clears throat> if, if it's a natural stone or treated stone or a live grown. Okay. Um, do you have any kind of update on the Argyle mine since it was scheduled to close this year? Do you have any, you know, anything you can share with us? I, I have not heard anything more than um, just that it's still scheduled to close in 2020. Um, but, I mean, that's what I heard last year. I haven't heard any updates since in many months. So I don't have any updates on that. I know that there are some very interesting diamonds that are see, appear to be unique to Argyle. And I talked about some of those today, those gray blue uh, uh, hydrogen uh, related stones. And then a lot of the intensely colored pink to red stones, uh, those seem to come a lot from Argyle. Not sure what's going to happen with those sorts of colored diamonds when the argyle mine closes. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, it will. Okay, so we're almost out of time. We'll do one more question. It'll be non-scientific. Sally, okay. what is your favorite color diamond? If you could pick any diamond, money was no object. What would be your favorite? Oh, uh, well, I first started looking at gem diamonds by looking at the the phosphorescence on the Hope Diamond and studying phosphorescence on type 2Bs. And so that's my, my first foray into gem diamonds and that's my first love. So I'd have to say uh, some type 2B blue diamond. Great, perfect. Okay, well, thank you so much. This is a fantastic presentation. Um, if you have any other questions that we didn't get to, please find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And uh, join us again next week where we'll be joined by Robert Weldon and he's gonna give us uh, he's going to tell us all about the art of photographing minerals, uh, gemstones, and jewelry. So thanks again to everyone for coming, and thanks to Sally, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye.